Welcome everybody to theme one, innovation procurement and contract vehicles. We have three fantastic speakers uh, this morning um, and to set us up today, we have uh, in the first talk, we have Louis Gunnigan from TU Dublin, and he's gonna talk about collaborative contracts in a BIM environment, learning from the Liskate School project. Over to you, Louis. Hi, my name is Louis Gunnigan, and I'm going to talk to you today about two different construction projects, one which has been completed and one which is setting out on its journey through the procurement process. My fellow authors on this are um, Paolo Gianni, who worked on the Liscati project in Italy, and Orna Hanley, who has been leading the Design Construct project for TU Dublin at Broom Bridge. My interest in this is that I have been promoting Alliance Contracting for several years, both in Ireland and in other countries. And I saw this as an opportunity to promote it further in Ireland. The things you'll hear about today are, first of all, the need to address the structure for collaboration, particularly in the context of BIM, and then how this was done through the FSE one contract on the Liscate project, how it integrated BIM into the project. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, TU Dublin Design Construct project itself and see how the Dublin, TU Dublin project can learn from the Liscate project. The um, McKinsey Global Institute in 2017 recommended that, the, that we need to rewire the contractual framework and that the BIM protocol should sit at the center of this. But we have been talking about increasing productivity in the construction industry through partnering and through various other uh, tools for years, going back to the Latham report, the Egan report, and even long before that. So this is not a new conversation, but the McKinsey Institute has, has uh, joined in that conversation more recently. And in 2018, we got uh, ISO 19650, which provides for a standard for information management in the context of the digital transformation that we need to uh, have in construction. And what it states is that the collaboration between the participants involved in construction projects and asset management will be pivotal to the delivery and operation of these assets. So the uh, information, the project's information protocol um, was something that was needed to integrate all of the team members' appointments. And that's something which was achieved very well in the Liscate project. The ori origins of FAC1 looks at something similar as well, because one of the problems that you have with bespoke alliance contracts for construction is they are like the buildings they are trying that you're trying to build uh, with the contracts. They are all different. They are all probably in different jurisdictions. They all have different clients, they have different architects and so on. And people find it very difficult to learn from bespoke contracts. So what FAC1 set out to do was to try to find a way of uh, bringing this into um, use so that the improved value and the reduced risk could be maximized across all construction projects. This was led by uh, Professor David Mosey from King's College in London, where he consulted with over 120 clients, consultants, contractors, and so on in 14 different jurisdictions. So it wasn't just the UK and tried to get an agreement for a flexible contract, which could be suitable for any type of project in any jurisdiction so that we wouldn't have to constantly go back learning from the bespoke ones. In 2016, the Framework Alliance contract FAC1 was published. It has been used on various different projects in the UK. It has also been used on this one in Italy, which we're going to talk about in, in just a minute. Um, it is going to be used for 50 billion euro worth of public work over the next number of years. And already there is evidence of real improved value through the use of this contract. So just to describe what it is, it's an umbrella contract that sits on top of all of the agreements that exist between clients, consultants, contractors, and suppliers. So it's not just a contract between a client and a contractor. It can support and integrate not just one project, but a program of projects, and they can be related or unrelated. It can deal with several different phases of a contract or different components within the contract, and crucially, it can manage or it can be used for a project which includes BIM or which uses BIM. It has been translated into all of the, um, the, the uh, countries which are on the screen there with more happening every day. And it is in use in some of these countries now, not just as I said in the UK. So the uh, FAC1 describes the parties to the contract as alliance members. And one of those members is the client, but there's also an alliance manager who's like a chairperson of 
this group of people. And it also has the facility to add additional members as the contract proceeds. But it also brings in as key members, as equal members within the contract, the consultants, the contractors, the suppliers, and the providers. And the idea behind that is that if everybody is trying to do the same thing, then we should be able to achieve real change. The um, alliance starts out by agreeing objectives, um, success measures, targets, incentives, and um, it looks at um, every type of contract that there is. So for example, there may be some type of contract between the clients and the, the, uh, the consultants, there may be another one between the client and the uh, contractor, there may be another one between the contractors and the subcontractors and so on. It deals with all of these. And what it does is looking, it looks at ways of managing risk and avoiding dispute. And it has structures within the contract for dealing specifically with those where everybody talks together on how they are going to do that. The key thing that they that it looks at is the supply chain um, collaboration. And it looks at how you can sustain this right through the whole life of the project. It looks at improving quality control through the joint risk assessments, the integrated uh, team agreements and monitoring of the work on site, lean programming. So in other words, everybody does all the programming together. So even the suppliers are involved in developing the program for the contract. Um, it looks at innovation uh, in relation to recycling and reduce landfill. And uh, it also um, it looks at how you share information, crucially BIM information, because um, one of the problems that we often have with BIM is that somebody is put in charge of BIM and then they're doing BIM and then uh, everybody else is feeding into it. Whereas in this situation, everyone is doing BIM. Uh, the ISO 1950 standard uh, stresses the collaboration between the participants. And what FAC1 does is it provides a collaboration environment where everything is transparent and everybody works together with the same data. Uh, FAC1 provides the deadlines, the gateways, and the interfaces within the program or the timetable as it's described within FAC1. And crucially, that brings that all the way down into the suppliers and down into the, the supply chain. It supports uh, direct licenses for intellectual property rights, and it also deals with things like early warnings for clash resolution and how they can be resolved. Okay, so that's FAC1. So let's see what happened then when that was applied to the Liscati School in Milan in Italy. Uh, by Irish standards, a school which uh, has a population of 150 is actually quite a small school, but then uh, 5 million of a project in public projects is not a very large project. But small projects can be just as complex as big projects. And it was interesting to see how this project proceeded. This was the first time that FAC1 had been used out of the UK and outside of the UK. And one of the reasons that it was used is uh, Paolo Gianna was um, tied into um, King's College when he was doing his PhD, but he was also working on this project. And this was an opportunity for him to use this as a case study. And he, with um, uh, Sarah Valagusa in the University of Milan, uh, approached the municipality to see would they use this, would they consider using this as a means of integrating BIM into the project. And when they started doing this, they started talking about data sharing, about model management, maximum involvement of contractors and suppliers. And in doing this, they, they found that this is a completely new way of doing work in Italy. So what they had to do was to work with the participants in the project to develop not just the contract, sorry, not just the project itself, but to uh, develop how it would be managed through a contract. So they had to talk to them about what would the contract actually be? What would they be happy with? What would they be satisfied to work in? Now, the key things there were the timetable, which was the program. And as I said, this allowed the interaction of all the different parties and all the subcontractors. And similarly, the risk register worked the same way. So when all of the risks were defined, they were allocated to the various different parties who could control the risks, but everybody worked together to ensure that both the program and the risk register would be achieved in a collaborative manner. And uh, within that, of course, the BIM models were then integrated uh, and provided all of the, the documentation that were needed by everybody. And again, the BIM was completely live. Everyone was using 
completely up-to-date information at all times. So the outcome, well, the first one, the first thing is it worked. It was the first one that was done in Italy. Uh, it did manage to get the data sharing and the BIM model management working properly. Crucially, it achieved huge, huge savings in time, 48%. And much of this was down to the fact that when they spoke to the suppliers, the supplier said, you shouldn't build this with intellectual concrete, you should build this with modern methods of construction. And they started maximizing the potential of the industry to actually try something new. 6.8% cost savings were also achieved. So it was a, an, an astonishingly um, convincing result. And also, of course, improved health and safety. Um, safe, um, the management of the site actually worked brilliantly too. If you want to get further information on this, I can't give you the information in a 15 minute uh, presentation, but if you wish to read the um, academic papers that have been written, go to Google Scholar, put in the Liscati Middle School, and you will get enough to keep you busy for the rest of the day. If you want to watch an eight minute video, which was prepared with uh, David Mosey and all of the different players who were involved in the Liscati School, the very interesting video, which is on that link. And when you get these slides, you'll be able to follow that link. Okay, so the main lessons that were learned, and there were nine of them, so there's, there's quite a bit here. The first thing is that you have to familiarize the market with the form of contract under consideration. And you have to emphasize that the, uh, the form of contract is a tool to address everybody's objectives and that everybody will work together to try to achieve those objectives. You have to involve the market in the development of the contract awarding methodology so that that is clear it's completely clear to everybody who is involved in it, and it's completely transparent. You set out the transparent processes that are there, and you agree those up at the start. Develop a clear series of things that will be supported by the alliance contract, such as the program, the information management, dispute resolution, IP rights, and so on. And the, the contract must involve all of the parties who will in uh, who will influence the outcome of the contract. And that goes right down into the supply chain. That was the first five of them, but there were four more. The first one, uh, the next one uh, then was to legally define the responsibilities of all the parties. So the first thing, first slide there was all about what's everybody's responsibility in relation to developing it. Now this is about delivering it. So follow a risk, a joint miss, a risk monitoring and management approach. And everybody has equal uh, responsibility and equal input. Manage all the information through the data environment in real uh, live time, real time access, live access, and all decisions are updated immediately so that nobody is waiting for that email that's supposed to come a week after the meeting was held or so on. So they were the principal lessons that were learned. So let's move on then. Let's move back to Dublin. Um, TU Dublin has purchased a site uh, in Broombridge, which is approximately, I, I think it's about kilometer and a half away from Grange Gorman, but it's also quite close to Blanchestown, which is where I'm, uh, uh, which is up on the, the, where that little screen is up on your, your, uh, your, your screen at the moment. And Tala, of course, is, would be down in the, um, the left-hand side, uh, quite a distance away, maybe an hour away on the, the Lewis. But it is um, something which would be used for all of TU Dublin. Uh, the uh, site itself is an old industrial site. The site it was used for um, uh, meat packing at one stage, but it was also used for recycling. It's bounded on the uh, northeast by the railway line on the canal and on all the other three sides by residential development. Um, it's, the, the idea of this project is that it would provide something new and innovative. It's a construction innovation centre, effectively. But it would also be built in, a, in an innovative way and it would provide for sustainability, it would promote sustainability, uh, and would be used as a sort of a beacon really for what we should be able to do with building from here on. So that's why we're looking at a different way of procuring it. There's a lot of information on that slide, and again, you'll get a chance to read it later on. Uh, so looking briefly at what it is now on the left-hand side, what we're aspiring to on the right-hand side, and uh, the grouping of the spaces. Uh, 3,900 square meters would be design and construct, 1,210 student uh, and social spaces. So for example, meeting rooms, canteen area, and various other things where um, students would use the space. And for sports, um, 2,200 uh, square meters of space in that, including an indoor uh, pitch as well. 
Okay, the project status, we're at the initial uh, end user uh, consultation has been completed. The strategic brief has been approved. Uh, preliminary design is about to commence and the procurement strategy is being developed. Now, um, we are doing market soundings at the moment. We've done them with various different people. They're all on the screen there. And we intend to do more of them, but due to COVID restrictions, they have been curtailed somewhat just yet. They, uh, we have found that there is considerable caution for the use of a collaborative project as is provided through FAC1. And the project team has now been challenged by these to show what precisely will the GCC contracts not deliver? What collaborative contract, what a collaborative contract would be required to deliver and how does it do so? And how would the risk be managed differently and the state's interests pr uh, protected in a, an alliance environment? So our next, next tasks are to develop the procurement strategy fully, finalize the project brief, approve uh, everything to move to stage two in the construction works management framework and appoint the design team. So in conclusion, the Lascate project showed that a collaborative contract approach can be used. It can maximize BIM, it can create um, a better environment for risk management, it can promote innovation, it can maximize knowledge, reduce costs, increase quality, and we are exploring how we can do this in an Irish context and learn from the Liscati project. And the question that we're left with is, how will the Irish construction industry get over its uh, reluctance to deal with collaborative contracts? Because right now it is quite reluctant. So that was a whistle stop tour through that. If you want to contact any of us, um, you can contact us on these, uh, these emails. Uh, I've no doubt that you'll think, oh my God, that's a huge amount of information in a small amount of time. Please go back and read the slides. Please read the paper um, and follow the other links that are within the uh, presentation. So Claire, back to you. Thank you, uh, every, thank you, Louis, that was fantastic. And I have a, a bazillion questions and on questions. If anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, if you go to the uh, right-hand side of your screen, there's a Q&A tab there and you can enter your questions uh, uh, there. Um, so now we're on to um, uh, our second uh, session, which is uh, the work breakdown structure applied in BIM framework in a construction project case study La Rotunda of Verona. Verona. And we've got uh, Fazane Shariari uh, from BIM Make, who's going to walk us through that presentation. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello again, everybody. And I do appreciate your attention to our work. Uh, in advance. <clears throat> Actually, before I start, I wanted to mention a point. I want you to see this work not as a report of a finished work, but rather as a, as a way to communicate what we are doing at this moment in a construction live uh, site, which is running even today and yesterday, actually. And to say what we have done up to now and then to see what the world is doing and if we can apply them, if we can use them to, in particular, to accelerate the construction site, if we can uh, use the arguments that is running today and tomorrow. Well, um, uh, I will represent ourselves. So uh, we will represent ourselves as a surveyor, Ricardo Romaniello, as a project manager of the, the project and a construction manager also of this project. And our architect, Farzana Shahriari, uh, which we provide the beam model and also construction management of this building, La Rotonda di Verona, which means rounded of the Verona. And uh, it, I, I, I'm not going to define a building information modeling as I expect that you are all um, expert in this uh, argument, but I wanted to mention which aspect of the building information modeling was useful for us, actually. Uh, it's multidimensional sites that provided for us because we could uh, 
provide a model, architectural model of the building, and in the same time going to arrange and manage the construction sites in the same time, which was quite important for us because, as I told you, the goal of the of this project was to manage the time, first of all, and the cost of this project. That was quite large scale project and complicated enough uh, to be obligated to use building information modeling inside this. So uh, as I told, it was a quite large scale project um, and like uh, like every other large uh, large projects we need we require to Here you can see the table, the famous table of breaking down of projects, uh, in particular used for big projects, complicated projects. And uh, you can see so many aspects here. Uh, for example, the first of, first of them is geometric, actually breakdown of a project, which is quite uh, clear for all of us. What, what does it mean? by uh, geometrical breaking down, but also the others, work breakdown, structural, uh, CBS, EBS, OBS, they are quite named during, uh, if you see uh, beam execution plans of projects, they are used uh, to breaking down projects. But as you can see, there are so many aspects, so many, uh, for, for instance, cost uh, breakdown uh, structure, uh, there are mm, different aspects in which we can split the project. The, the question is, the point is, which of them is going to be useful for us? Uh, which of them can, be, can help uh, the construction manager to accelerate the, the work? Uh, and then uh, once one of them is uh, used and applied, in which manner, in which... Um, a structure, we are going to split the whole project inside its elements because fortunately or unfortunately, there is no standard for none of them to splitting down. There is no, nothing dictated to us. But I wanted to uh, say in this point why for this project in particular, we use work breakdown a structure, WBS, famous because it uh, provided for us a flexible uh, structure to break down the whole. Uh, we could say even we used cost splitting inside the work breakdown structure. We, we split the physical model of the Verona, of uh, La Rotonda of Verona uh, inside its physical elements inside work breakdown structure. So it provided quite flexible uh, platform for construction manager. And again, I'm saying which of this breaking down a structure could be used depends on two aspects. 
two elements. First, the goal of the project, which was uh, for us, uh, for instance, was to organize the time and the cost of the whole project. And second, it depends on the nature of the project. So, uh, so many aspects that are involved during this project. For us, uh, for La Rotonda of Verona, the shape of the project was uh, the nature, the main nature of the project. Next, please. Uh, this uh, project, La Rotonda of Verona, was uh, quite suitable for us to apply work big done structure. It was interesting even for us to know that this uh, WBS, for the first time ever, was used by uh, Army of United States, Defense Ministry of United States, just thinking about the, um, the requirements and nature of the Army project which could be also useful for us for our architectural projects. And uh, then it uh, came into architecture and in construction uh, industry, in particular for the project management arguments. And as I, as I mentioned also before, it provided not only for architecture, but, but also for other uh, platforms quite flexible and fluent um, nature to choose in which aspect we are going to split the project. Um, it's, um, it's not like just splitting down the exact work and job in, inside the construction site, but also it's related to the cost to, to model, to element to structure and to other um, aspects of, of a building as a whole. In, in, so in particular for complex and for large scale project, again, for La Rotonda of Verona, the nature of this project was the best choice for our construction manager to choose. WBS, work work on structure. The next please. So, so you can see here the project, the building, it was quite beautiful, uh, I mean, aesthetically, but also uh, in terms of the project manager, uh, project management, it was quite a um, challenging uh, project, in, uh, in particular for the time timetabling of this project. Uh, it was uh, a, a, ex, a store of the OIS last century, so it was like a store for the city uh, Verona, which is located in the North Italy. And uh, it was uh, developed, constructed and developed between two world wars um, last century again. Now uh, Mario Botta, which is quite a famous architect, decided to uh, actually project this, uh, design at this change use of this building to a new commercial center for, for the Italy. And, uh, once this project was passed to us, the main goal was cost control and time control because it arrived to a point that seemed like impossible to uh, to organize this construction site with classical manner and classical uh, um, actually attitude toward architecture that they used to apply on this construction site. So the next place. Yes, here you can see the uh, work picked on a structure designed by our construction uh, manager. Uh, you can see in the first, the first level, we decided to divide the whole construction by uh, four main buildings. The main building that you can see, La Rotonda, which, is me, which means uh, rounded as the building number 10. And then in the next level, we just decided to see this building as a pizza. So uh, divides by uh, slices. And then uh, either element is inside the slide, a slice or outside or in a main dome or in a galleries or either in the corridors, which connecting the galleries. Then in the next level, we decided to split the uh, element by the level that is located. 
you can see here uh, in the next level macro activity. So three main activities, uh, which is structural, architectural, and or uh, security uh, intervention. Then in the next level, we have micro activities. So the, there is a list for us with the quite clear and exact jobs that are going to be run inside the construction site. Uh, the exact job that uh, will be uh, running each day. And then in the next level, you, we have a cost list divided by each uh, micro activity. So uh, next please. If you choose a single element here, you can see that uh, you can uh, decide whether in which level of the work breaking down a structure of our project, it's, uh, it, it obtained a number com combined by uh, all of those levels of splitting down. Uh, so if you just touch a single element, you can see a number which is work Break down a structure uh, attached to this element and combined by five numbers. And uh, as I mentioned before earlier, it was just uh, not like a finished work. We are going to create a dynamo language to um, to have it automatically uh, procedure like. Uh, um, selecting each element, you can see which work breakdown structure number it obtained automatically, not uh, inserted inside the model manually. Because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, complicatedness of this project uh, was was uh, necessary for us to to uh, have it uh, inside the billing information modeling and also having it more intelligent um, manner to, to organize each element. In, the, in this uh, slide, you can see the uh, last vision of this building. If, for us, it was impossible to organize this building, La Rotonda of Verona, uh, without using this work breakdown structure and even using the PBS, which was applied before and in, also in other uh, beam execution plans, uh, it was uh, much more flexible for us, while uh, physical breakdown structures seemed like much more classical uh, manner and attitude toward building information modeling and also toward project management uh, in, in the argument of escalating down the project. We really do appreciate, again, your attention toward our work, and I hope it was useful. We also hope that we can go uh, further to create it much more intelligent and beam beamalized, as we are saying always, uh, this procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fazani. That was fabulous and, and uh, thank you everybody for staying with us over the technical glitch there. So now we'll move on to uh, Robert Moore from TU Dublin, who's gonna take us through exchange information requirements and BIM execution plans according to ISO uh, 9650, explaining uh, CNTR 17654-2001. Thanks, uh, 2021, apologies. Over to you, Rob, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for attending my presentation this morning. So I'll just start off with the, uh, with the presentation. As, as Claire said, it's about the EIR and BEP. Um, I were involved in authoring a new technical report um, that was just published recently. And the technical report was called the Guideline for the Implementation of execu uh, Exchange Information Requirements and BIM Execution uh, Plans uh, on a European level. Uh, based on ISO 19650. So basically what I want to do is talk through that technical report that, were, that I authored recently. Just a little bit about myself. Um, I work in the Grange Government Development Agency. I've been there since 2016. And just a bit about Grange Government. Grange Government is uh, a, a site. Uh, Grange Government Development Agency uh, was established in 2016 to develop the St. Brendan's Hospital site in North 
uh, North Dublin inner city. And just what we're working on at the moment, this shows some of the construction projects that we've actually finished and also construction projects that are about to go into construction uh, or, or, or are in construction at the moment. So there's quite a bit going on up in the campus at the moment. Just to talk about Grange Gorman Development Agency, our mission is to make Grange Gorman the world-class development. Our vision is to be recognized for community urban regeneration and our vision our, our, and our values. And we would look at all these values will be achieved through the use of information management. So just what I am going to discuss today, first, I'm going to explain to people the technical report 176. 5054. <clears throat> and then I'll also look at GD's, GDA's approach to implementing the technical report so people can work together better at Grange Gorman. And the method that we use for this is we have an information management plan um, to, to achieve this. So just to go on, and one of, the, one, of the, one of the first meetings that I went about the technical report, this was said by David Churcher, um, and I found it was fairly, fairly precise about what was going on, uh, what was happening was that people were given pre-populated documents for EIRs and BEPs. And really the only project specific information was the title on them. And also as well as that, the, the EIR and the BEP weren't linked. So the BEP didn't answer questions that was raised in the EIR. <clears throat> so I suppose really, there was an evolution. Um, there was an evolution as we were writing the technical report. What we thought we were going to be producing wasn't what we produced at the end. And I think it was better from that, that our compromises became to be an improvement on the report. And also, as well as that, there's an evolution in what GDA are doing. We don't think we're perfect where we are with the information management plan, but we believe that it's the pathway to get to where we want to be. And I suppose there's, there's also a bit of an elephant in the room on this. I, um, when we were producing the technical report, there was a big talk about producing a template that would be also published alongside the technical report, but we didn't. We didn't end up producing it. And also, I suppose, with the Grange Gorman um, information management plan is, it doesn't look like what people expected an EIR and BEP to look like. So this was a quite a big shock to people uh, when, when they first started using it. So I'm just going to go back and where did we start? I suppose with the technical report, what we did was we started from scratch. We, we, we ignored all the templates that was be floating around in industry from various different sources for the last five, 10 years. And we started from scratch. And where we, where we started from was what was said in ISO 19650. So that was the basis of what we did. And we ignored everything else that was done before. And I suppose the same for the uh, Grange Government Information Management Plan. I started producing that probably back in 2016 and 2017. And it was a case of go getting away from the templates that was, was already in the industry. So what does the technical report look like? So to just give you a quick idea or whistle stop tour of the technical report. Um, what we tried to do in the technical report was make it as simple as possible and easy for the user to use. So we talked about the, the first part was the EIR, um, pre-invitation pre to tender. So that was when the EIR was produced. And then we looked at the tender response to pre-appointment BEP. And then we went on to what needed to be done for the appointment BEP. And then we have some annexes as well. So that was just a very quick way of looking at what we were doing and, and how to make the document structured as easy and clearly as possible. We also followed on from that clearness um, was to directly link the elements that was stated for what is required in exchange information requirement directly to the sections in the document. So you can, as you read um, ISO 19650, and we always think it, it is important that ISO 19650 is the source, is what you should be going back to, and what the technical report is just adding extra guidance and more explanation to what is very lightly explained within the standard. Um, so we did the same approach then. We picked out the important parts that was specified, specified in ISO 19650, and then we made, we aligned them then with the sections as we did. So it was a very logical read where people read it. 
We also tried to make the guidance within the document as simple for people to follow as well. So what we did was we made a structure, a simple structure of a five paragraph structure and all the sections in it follow that five part, follow, follow that five part structure. So the first part was a plain language explanation into what, uh, what the concept behind it was. Um, then was the added value of that concept. Then it was kind of guidance on how you would fill that in in, uh, in in EIR or BEP. And then we looked at giving practical examples of what the information should be. And then we finished that off with, if there was any other areas in the guidance or documentation, that um, other documents that, that's worth reviewing to get some more knowledge to include that as well. So just to go on to the annexes, and I, I think the annexes, there's some, so there's some good stuff in the annexes. So I suppose the first annex was, it does say template, but really all it is is tables. There are very basic tables and a very basic starting point explanation of how you should use the standard. Then in Appendix B, we went on and we gave examples. We started looking at examples, and I suppose this is why your template didn't work, because originally we produced a template that was a, a spreadsheet, and we, the feedback was that it wasn't flexible enough. So what we did was give an example of just using a very a simple uh, A4 document with tables. Then there was an Excel sheet. And then we said, like, there's other ways of looking at communicating this information graphically. It could be communica communicated by diagrams, by uh, mind maps or other kind of um, documents or process maps as well was a, was a way of doing it. And also, we, we couldn't ignore that a relational database was also a very suitable way of doing it. Well, within within the group and time constraints, we had no expertise to actually provide any examples. When we were doing the document, scope was also a very hot topic that we discussed quite a number of times during during the process. So what we looked at was we we discussed should information management planning be part of the document, and it was in the document, it was out of the document, and then it was finally decided that what we would do is within the clauses of the actual technical report that would stick rigidly to what it said in ISO 19650 part two. And what we did was we included this because we thought it was a very important part, we'd include it as an annex. And I suppose what we wanted to do was also look at that there is more than one way to present this information that a spreadsheet could be a good way to do it, but also a Gantt chart with a schedule could be a way of doing this. And also as well as the relational database what was available for using this. And then finally, what happened was in our opening, in our first meetings, a lot of people from different um, countries around Europe looked at good practices that was done in their countries and tried to include it in the body of the standard. We, we understood that this was not appropriate, so but we didn't want to lose that good work that people were presenting. So we, we included it then um, as Annex D uh, for examples of information, uh, project information standards. So the scope thing was a very, a very hot topic, I, I must admit, and to understand what we're going to include and what we're not going to include. So I suppose things that people usually included in a BEP was a capacity, a capability and capacity assessment, which wasn't included. We also didn't include, but it does have to be done part, part, part of the project, was a mobilization plan and also um, a risk assessment uh, on the delivery information. These documents must be also included to be compliant with ISO 19650, but are outside what is required in an EIR and BEP. And that was just something that we thought was very uh, worth communicating very strongly. So just to move on of, to just give you a, a rough outline of the process of how we got to where we did and, and where we probably should go is we, we first looked at what we we're going to deliver. And we, we thought that what we'd be delivering was guidance, a template, and then examples. So we did pre start preparing this. And when we went out for the first consultation, it was very clear to us that the template that we were producing was not flexible enough for all project types. And it, it, there was no way of producing something that would be like this. Now, so what we did produce was we removed most of the template and added it on as screenshots or in the annex or, or shots of, or, of some templates there in the annex. And we focused on the guidance. We, we spent a lot of time in getting the guidance right. Now, one thing that did happen was when we went out to consultation again, 
the same people that said this template wasn't suitable for them or then said, where is the template? So it was the kind of thing that people wanted, the simple fix. And I suppose going back to the original thing is EIRs and BEPs are templated beyond use. It means that we, we, we have to go beyond that and the exemplar. Realistically speaking, if we had resources and the capacity for the people that was in it, really the examples, we really felt that if we had the time to spend on the examples, we spent quite a significant amount of time in the examples. But we did feel that they were very, uh, that they weren't comprehensive enough to actually give the guidance that was needed. Um, but, but as I said, it was resources within the group. So just to move on then, so how does this look like in a project? So obviously I were trying to use any of the, the, the pathways for, the, for, the, for what we're doing in, my, in the technical report and implemented as we we're doing it in Grange Gorman. So what we produced was, we produced an information management plan according to ISO 19650. The reason why we didn't call it an ER or BEP or any of them wording there was because we included everything that was stated as a requirement of the ISO 19650. So we did have um, the capability and capacity and other things there that wasn't what wasn't included. So as a start, and we, we also knew that Excel was the way for us to go, that the A4 was too simplistic for what we needed and we didn't have the capacity to do a relational database. So just to move on, so what does that look like when we went in that it's one Excel sheet, that's one place one place that everything to do with information management is stored. So within that, we have a sheet for our EIR. So at cur currently at the moment, we're developing our EIRs out. Um, I wouldn't say we're perfect, but there's a, there's a lot of work done, uh, but there's more work to be done on this. And then what, what we were doing then was um, we did a, a template for the contractor to come back with the BEP. But what we really think is the way that it should be looked at is that we have an EIR and then there's a response back for each of them. So people directly talk about how they're going to use that information. So the other things that's required within the BEP is the, um, the functional uh, breakdown or how the commercial relations between people are and also federation strategy, which is very new and we don't really implement that because also we have to think about the maturity of our supply chain that we don't want to be asking them for a complete change um, straight away. So we're kind of bringing it in gradually. And our IT resources, they are the requirements from the EIR BEP. Now, just to look how we, how we manage within the information management plan is, we have all the documentation stored separately in a common data environment. So the information management plan is kind of an index to finding the information. So it's done through hyperlinks that brings out to the actual files themselves. And that's what we found that trying to, trying to compress everything into project specific EIRs, BEPs was just very labor intensive and um, we didn't feel it was the best way to do it. So just to give an example of some what we call um, project information management or what we're doing. And then what we wanted to look at was um, project uh, info for what the contractor would come back with to us or, or the supply chain was, we felt process maps was a good way to, to do approaches. Just one other thing is the capital framework has also got stated deliverables on it. Uh, we feel that it, it, um, there needs to be alignment between this public spending code, the capital management framework and ISO, and this should be done on a government level. It shouldn't be up to individual clients to actually do this. It'd be better off having it done in, on the government level. So just to finish off, so just about the technical report, the technical report can help people better understand ISO 19650. You should always go back to ISO 19650 for what needs to be done. It is, it can be flexible enough to suit people's projects. It can help people progress with their approach to information management. It's a stepping stone. I won't say the document is perfect, but it is a good stepping stone. And within the GDA, our information management plan is focused on giving people the information they need. So it's about making stuff searchable. It's a pathway for people to improve their information management. And also it reduces people's work because now we're not asking for a, a 500 or 200 page BEP. We're saying that people can store their methods and procedures on their common day environment and then just give us hyperlinks to where they are. So it's not bringing everything into one. And just to leave on a final note is 
culture beats technology. Uh, and thank you very much. And that's my presentation. Thank you, Rob. That was great. And uh, you can ask the, the panel questions um, or the speakers questions if you go to the Q&A uh, section to the right hand side of the screen. Um, so we, we've got one question in here, and I think it applies to everybody uh, in terms of savings. So, Louis, you said up front that there were savings, cost savings, and there were also time savings uh, using the uh, the contracts that you deployed. And Rob, you just spoke really about, uh, you know, a, making things better, giving people hyperlinks, etc. And, and for Zane, I'd love to hear if there was any savings on time and cost for you. So we'll kick off with you, Louis. You stated the stats on the savings for that particular project, because like, um, and we know that projects run over time and over budget. Was that like an overall saving, or was that just specific elements of the uh, of the projects using the contract? In, in relation to the the time savings, most of those were achieved by moving towards using modern methods of construction and off-site construction. Yeah. Um, I would emphasize, though, that it was a saving on construction time. There was an enormous amount of time, extra time, put into setting the thing up in the first place. Okay. You know, so if you were to look at the overall project development, it wouldn't have been as dramatic as, as that. However, okay. construction time saves money. You know, saving some construction time saves money because you're saving prelims and so on. Um, the cost savings... Uh, again, it was a case of different people coming together and looking at ways in which they could do things better. But then what they also did was they reinvested some of that back in and got more scope for the same amount of money and still got it in 48 or with 48% time saving. Was it was great. quite a spectacular result. Absolutely. And I guess the upfront uh, uh cost and time will only get better as people use these contracts more and more, I assume. Of course, it, and it, it is all about, uh, you know, what we talk about with BIM, we talk about collaboration and we talk about sharing everything, but it's not just the information that you share. When you, when you start developing a working relationship with somebody for sharing anything, and you have a structure whereby you can share everything, such as the program and so on, people begin to share ideas. And um, just, just on, a, on a, a short aside, I'm building my own house at the moment and I'm talking to a contractor about using a collaborative contract and pain share and pain gear and pain share and so on. And he's blown away with it. He, he really wants to do this. He wants to use this as his business model from now on. And he's saying, why have we never been doing this before? And you know, he, he wants to work with people this way. So there is an appetite for it. And the last question I had is, when are we going to get over our fear of doing this? Yeah. There's, there's nothing to be afraid of here. Yeah, no, I agree. We'll come back to that, actually. I'll, I'll move on to, to uh, for Zane. It, it, and was there any uh, cost savings and time savings with your approach to the project? It was it's so interesting to mention this, that once the project manager of this building decided to apply building information modeling was quite a big decision because they already, they have been in a, a strict cost and time they, uh, it was like, but just they must um, to put so many other extra cost, uh, money and also time just to provide the B model of the building and also to to put uh, the project inside another street totally inside building information modeling. It was totally the meaning of investigation in the beam. But yes, I would say yes, the, the answer, the quick answer is yes, absolutely, it, it's working. Actually, it's not finished, it will be finished at the end of this year. So the right answer will be given at the end of this year. But I think I'm so positive, yes. It was a Brilliant. good investigate, yes. Brilliant, thank you. And, and Rob, to you, um, you know, in terms of this new ISO and everything, uh, do you foresee that it's gonna save time and, and money? Well, I, I suppose when we're implementing it, uh, how we're implementing the information management plan, we find that it does save people's time because people spend an awful amount of time looking for information. Yeah. And also, as well as that, um, having it in an Excel, people are familiar with Excel instead of going to different common date environments, because if people might be using several common date environments across uh, their work. So if they have one single way of doing it, there's great search facilities within the Excel sheet as well. Um, so we, we're finding that on a 
on a personal level, people aren't getting this frustrated because where is this? I need that information. We're, we're putting everything in. If somebody needs information, it's put in either as supporting information, the acceptance criteria. So people are finding what they need to find. Mm -hmm. And also we have a deliverable schedule there as well. So we understand what people are delivering to us uh, during the projects. So yes, we, we, it, it does save time having a standardized approach to the way of working. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and just before we close the session, Louis, I'd love to come back. And it's a real passion of mine as well around the collaboration and the fear of change and the fear of moving forward. Um, you know, it, it'd be great to uh, dig into that a little bit more and how we I mean, I, and I think it's pioneers like the people on this call here and leaders that help the industry see the benefits of doing this, you know, without it impacting on IP or the way they, you know, um, loss of uh, of uh, market share, etc. I mean, Louis, any any advice for the people <laughs> listening? Oh, okay, I, I, one of the things I did do is I, I studied um, managing change, and and one of the things that you always find is that people are reluctant to move from what they have. If they have something and it doesn't work, it, it is the case that this is the devil we know and we can deal with it. The devil we don't know is much more mm. scary, even yeah. though everybody is telling us that, that it's not a devil at all. Um, I think what you have to do is you have to keep showing people that it works and you have to keep trying to find ways in which you can um, chip away at some of the problems that they have. You may not go you know, full pelt into using FAC1 in Ireland, but you might find a new way of managing risk assessment and say, well, that's just part of FAC1. Now let's find a new way of doing programming, you know, where we all collaborate. Yeah. And, and you, you gradually build people's idea up that, hey, collaboration is actually good. You know, let's get yeah. a structure around it. Oh, there just happens to be one here. You know, let's, let's then go for that. So yeah. I, I think it is really a case of, you know, it's like the dripping tap, you know, if you keep working yeah. at it. Slowly, slowly. It Gently, yeah. gently, yeah. Uh, we have another question here, for, one for Rob. Uh, how are you finding it, the transition from design stage to construction stage? I, I suppose that's a very broad question and, and just to focus on it, probably on the information management side of it, what we have is the same process for the design team as the contractor. We have an information management plan and we try to keep th things as similar as possible because we, as the client, we look at just a project uh, and it has them two phases. We obviously understand there's two actors within them phases. Um, what we do find is by the time the construction phase comes around, um, it, by the time the construction phase comes around, the design team are very confident and comfortable with our information management plan, plus our naming. We, we spend, we, we look at the, the naming as one of the most critical things to make sure that information is searchable and reusable. So they, they are indoctrinated in, in our, I'd say complicated naming. Yeah, there's actually a second part to that question. Apologies, Rob. And it's like, are you using a similar Excel EIR for the design team to prepare and issue the contract? Yeah, yeah. So, so really, what what we're using the EIR is to bring together requirements uh, and acceptance criteria, supporting information on it. So there's different requirements needed for. The, the contractor than the design team. So, but but the process is still the same. A requirement is a requirement. So what we want to do is build up the supporting the level of information needed, the acceptance criteria uh, and supporting information. And I, I, I will say that that's what we're focusing on at the moment is to get our existing information right, that it's reusable. So I, I, so yeah, it's, it's the okay. same process. And, and the design team should be adding information requirements because they become the ER and the ER might have information requirements during the construction period. That's great. And uh, I, I think we're up to time now. And so I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the three of you for uh, three very informative, excellent uh, presentations. Thank you for that. And also thanks the audience for some fantastic questions as well. And with that, we'll, we'll end this session. Thank you. Thank you.